Hey, good morning, church. How's everybody today? Good Isn't that beautiful compared to the weather we've had? <laughs> Yesterday morning, we came in for Ben's breakfast in here, and it was just frigid. By the time we left, it was really nice. It was a great change. So we had a had, had a great breakfast yesterday morning, and uh, the cold didn't stop everyone from coming. So uh, we had a really good time of fellowship and some really nice discussion on some things in here about what God had done in people's lives and the journey that they had gone through, and uh, kind of a, a wake up call of you know the topic was why does God allow bad things to happen to good people, which seems to be everybody's big question when we when we think about it. And so we explored that a little bit yesterday and and uh, really, really uh, had a lot of great points, a lot of great discussions on what happened in different people's lives. And so it was really nice to be able to get together and do that. And so then coming up on March 4th, we have our next men's breakfast in here. And you know, there's a rumor going around that there's going to be pancakes and things there this time around. So, um, it wasn't a rumor yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a promise. It was a promise. Okay. Well, I guess, I guess I'm committed for that one. Okay. You got to be held accountable there, dude. Yeah, I know. I know. Doug almost had coffee all over the <laughs> Uh, we welcome those who are joining us online today again and uh, have a lot of uh, good people out there. We have some of our uh, congregants here today who are out sick, and so we want to lift them up in prayer as well, that, uh, that God would do a mighty work in their lives and, and bring them back to wholeness and fullness uh, of their health as well. Orange Track Racing. Believe it or not, this next Saturday we begin season 18 18 years uh this has been going on the ministry goes on and it's a a lot of fun we have that so february 11th we start up season 18 and it should be a really really good time as well then jumping ahead into the month lenten season believe it or not is going to be kicking up we have wednesday february 22nd ash wednesday um, which begins the six weeks before easter sunday so we start our Lenten season with Ash Wednesday, and we're going to be studying our Lenten series by Max Lucado, and it's in the footsteps of the Savior, and it's really nice because it's a video as well as a study series um, that goes on through the Holy Land, and he takes you the journey of the disciples as they as they went through, and so it's a really really neat thing to uh, take a look at the Holy Land, and and I taught us a. Uh, a series like this years ago, and so I'm really, really excited about this one um, as we come through our Lenten season. And then Great Street Cinema, we're going to convert this back into a, a theater space again, and that's coming up here in March. Details will follow. It's typically the first Saturday in March. So right now we're looking to see what licenses are going to be available for the movies that we want to show, so we're going to get back to you on that one. And then jumping ahead into April, April 1st, and no, this is not a joke, we are having Iron Sharpens Iron Conference down in Davenport, and we do have a clipboard back in the back table back here with sign-up forms on it, so in case you want to go with that, we're putting a group together. If we get a group of 10 or more in there, we get a discount on the tickets. Uh, so if you are interested, please sign up on the board there, and we can get that coming. So those of you that, that follow us on Facebook and everything, I, I did put up a post yesterday and it said that we should be excited about going to church as we are about the Super Bowl. So I offered up, it's in there, it's in writing, that if Pastor Terry today makes a really good point about something, you can go ahead and dump Gatorade over the top of his head. So um, in case you didn't bring one, I did set a bottle up here um, for you, just in case, and so no pressure, Terry, or you know anything like that. But uh, uh, we do think you should be excited about church as you are about Super Bowl, about the things of the world. You should be excited about what God is going to do in your lives. So, uh, as we come into this time of worship here, we would like to go to God in prayer, shall we? Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you for the beautiful sunshine that you bring into our lives today. Um, both the one outside and the one inside. Lord, we thank you for 
joining with us here in this space today, that we are here to be able to worship freely and openly and that in and through your presence, Lord, we, we gain all of what we need to do to get us through life. And we praise you and thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to indwell within us, to guide and direct our hearts and minds to follow you more closely. Lord, as we uh, come into this time of worship, we just ask a special blessing on Pastor Terry as he comes to give the message that you have laid upon his heart to give. And Lord, if it's a really great message, um, you know, the, the Gatorade is sitting right here. So we just praise you and thank you and those kind of things. And we, we thank you, Lord, for being with us here today and for bringing your word and your message to us in spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So our call to worship this morning comes from Psalms 46, 1 through 3. And this comes from the New Living Translation. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> He's really thinking he's going to make some really great points. He got out the big one here. So we're going to. It's not orange. But, you know. <laughs> oh, man. You got to have fun. You got to have fun. Um, so God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help us in times of trouble. So we will not fear when the earthquakes come and the mountains crumble to the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam and let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. And that tells us about the mighty power of God. That speaks to us about his almighty power and a striking statement of God's power and of his sovereignty. When we listen to the words of that, that he is our refuge, he is our strength and always there and ready for us in times of trouble. We had a really great illustration of this yesterday when we were having our discussions in here and, and uh, Bill was talking about uh, an article that he had wrote that, you know, as we struggle through the times of life, God is always out there and he's, he's holding his hand out. He's there all the time, but it's up to us to take his hand in those times of trouble. We have to reach out to him. We have to accept his help. But he is always there. And that power and that sovereignty, those two items are interrelated. They're two intimate ideas of God's strength and his character. Such thoughts have very, very practical applications for our lives as well. God's power and authority help us out of any trouble at any time, anywhere, and any place. All we have to do is call upon him. So as we read this passage, we're reminded that God is our salvation and our refuge in times of need. God is our rescuer in times of trouble. And and if we go to Psalms 37, 40, if we just back up a couple of verses, it says, The Lord rescues the godly. He is their fortress in times of trouble. The Lord helps them, rescuing them from the wicked. And he saves them and they find shelter in him. The Hebrew parallelism that they're drawing in here is that his help is there. It means that he is our salvation and our refuge. We can seek shelter in his care. God helps us if we're in any kind of trouble whatsoever, anytime, anywhere. A mighty fortress is our God. So how do we tap into that power and authority? What do we have to do? Well, it's really simple. We just need to pray and we just need to have faith. As the nature outside and the, and the forces of nature threaten us at times, and all of the violence and all of the problems and everything that is going on in the world today threaten our security. Prayer expresses our confidence then that God's strength and protection are there for all of his people against anything that would come against them. The cataclysmic events of nature and history cannot threaten God's people for he is with us. And God is invincible. So Pastor Terry's today, his message for us is, God, or where are you, God? And so it's our need to call out to him in our times of trouble is saying, where are you? The neat thing is he's holding out his hand the whole time. All we have to do is call upon him in prayer and in faith. Let us pray. Lord God, we just come before you right now. We open our hearts and our minds 
for you. We open our ears to hear the message that you would put upon our hearts, our Holy of Holies. Lord, come into our spirit today. Fill us full of your Holy Spirit so that we might enter into your presence now. Lord, fill us full of your understanding. Reveal to us your ways. And Lord, we just praise you and thank you that we are here and we are open to hear your message today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Just in case I get thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's a beautiful day out, as Mark said. This message has been playing on my heart for a while now because I'm watching people in my life and in my my circle of influence go through so much and some of them and some of you at some point in your life may have asked this very question where are you God I can remember sitting on the floor of my apartment after uh, my ex-wife and I split and the only thing I could do to pass the time because this is you know before gaming consoles and all that good stuff I just was playing solitaire on the floor and talking to God saying, why God, where are you? Why did you allow this to happen? Well, eventually a message came to me and said, I didn't allow this to happen. You and your ex-wife did. So that's on you. <laughs> you need to figure out what, you, what went wrong and I will help you with that. But there are people in our lives and, and, and maybe some of you right now that you might be in a season where you're asking this question on a regular basis. You know, things happen in our lives where it's so hard to see God. It may be difficult to understand where God is. I remember, well, in fact, just a week ago, a little over a week ago was my mom's birthday. It would have been the seventh birthday that she's had in heaven. And I remember when she passed, things went very quickly. She, Dad took her to, uh, to the hospital in their hometown. They life flighted her to Des Moines. She was there for a day or two and then they life flighted her to Omaha. That was on Friday. The last time I spoke with her was on Sunday. And on Monday night, about just after seven o'clock, she passed. Now, I was mad at myself for one because I went back home. Because Dad said, go home. There's nothing you can do here. It'll be fine. And that was really hard. And it was like, why did you allow me to do that, God? Why didn't you tell me to stay? But he had different plans. That's where that difficulty to understand comes into play. And throughout our lives, we go through so many difficult times. That might be a loss of a home, a job, a loved one, money, just to name a few. It might even be bullying, which I know all about because I was that, I was on the receiving end of that. But as we're about to find out, when we ask God, where are you? He is going to answer you. The question is, are you ready to listen? The old saying goes, hindsight is twenty twenty, And as you look back on your life, it's easy to go, well, I should have done this or I should have done that. But it, the saying means that we're understanding things from the past with a new knowledge and understanding that we didn't have then. One could say it's like going back so that we can go forward. A few years ago, we did a Bible study called Total Forgiveness, written by R.T. Kendall. As we went through this study, God blessed me with that knowledge and understanding for some things. And he gave me a new way of looking at those past hurts. He gave me that new knowledge, that new understanding, and the ability to start healing. And that healing led to forgiveness. It also led to freedom. But I had
and to look back to move forward. In many cases, this means that you may have to think about a time or a person or even something from the past, but you have to look at it through God's eyes, through his lens to better understand it. And in that moment, we all have to decide if we're going to hang on to or if we're going to release the past. Yesterday at Men's Breakfast, we had a, a discussion about past hurts as part of the, the study or the devotional. And it was that study, Total Forgiveness, that allowed me to go, nope, I'm not hanging on to that. I'm letting it go. I don't need to hang on to that anymore. It's Basically, I sat in jail cell with the door wide open long enough. So the truth for you here is that you cannot move forward if you're going to hold on to the past. And you can try, but if any of you ever been caught in the mud or stuck on the ice and all your tires do is spin, or you get stuck in that snow drift, all your tires do is spin, that's exactly what it's like. And you're going to get nowhere extremely quickly. These types of things can be very crippling and they'll keep you in a dark place if you continue to spin your tires. So I want you to visualize just for a moment. Imagine you're in a room, there's two chairs. The one you're sitting in and the other chair that's across from you is the one, is that thing. Whatever it is, it's that person, it's that event, it's whatever it is. And as you're sitting there and, and you're realizing that you have to face this, maybe your heart's starting to pound. And you start to sweat. Anybody get, get that? You get in those situations, it's like, is it hot in here or is it just me? But your heart is pounding. It feels like it's going to jump out of your chest. And then all of a sudden your mind, you realize your mind is just racing, going from one thought to another and to another. Why can't I just let it go so it's just me and the empty chair sitting in the room? You search for words. It might be a question. You might need to say something, but you're searching for words. But here's the thing. Here's the one thing that we forget. There's something, so actually someone else in that room with you. Whether you realize it or not, God is there. Whether you realize that he exists or not, God is there. But you may be saying, Father, where are you? Help me. Show me where you are. Tell me what I should be doing. I think back to now 22 years, almost 22 years ago when the we had the terror attack on our country. And people were jumping out of the Twin Towers. And people in my life, both in person and online, were saying, where was God? Why isn't he here to help? horrible decision. God was with them. I posted uh, both on my personal page and on uh, our Grace Street page this week about God and, and loving on him and be, him being faithful to us. And someone posted, F you God, mm. as a comment. And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed about how what do you want me to do, God? Do you want me to respond? Should I leave it alone? What am I supposed to do? He said, well, you sent out that post about the sermon this Sunday. <laughs> Where are you, God? Don't address the comment directly. Just post that. I don't know if that person is watching or, or not. 
but I do know it caught someone else's eye, and they're watching today. God took this bad comment on social media and he changed it and turned it for good. In our call to worship this morning, we heard that God is our refuge. He is always there to help, and because of that, there is no need to fear anything. And so I wasn't fearing anything at that point. I just did it, regardless of what came after that. Now, Pastor Mark read us that, those verses from uh, the New Living Translation. I'm going to read this. This comes from the Passion Translation. It's a new thought-for-thought uh, thought translation that is a little bit uh, more thought for thought than the New Living Translation is. But listen to it this way. God, you're such a safe and powerful place to find refuge. You, you're a proven help in time of trouble. More than enough and always available whenever I need you. So we will never fear. Even if every structure of support. And it, there's a note in there that says, Earth itself were to crumble away, we will not even, when the earth quakes and shakes, moving mountains and casting them into the sea, for the raging roar of stormy winds and crashing waves cannot erode our faith in you. Let's face it, fear of the earth shakes and quakes for those that live on the west coast and other parts of the world are very real. The closest earthquake to us happened down in Missouri, believe it or not. And it was felt in southern Iowa. I've never felt an earthquake. Don't have any idea what it was, but I have seen a tornado up close and personal. As I stand right here, there was a fifth wheel where that bookcase is. And I'm crouched down in, under this little hill and I poke my head up because, you know, I'm thin and curious. And I see this tornado come down grab this fifth wheel, spin it around, and then slam it down on its top. And it was gone. We had a tent stake in our fold down, and the two pump tent with the two bicycles that were just leaned up next to a tree that's over by the kitchen door, didn't move. Didn't move at all. But we fear the things that happen in nature. Earthquakes. Uh, I'm not so fond on wind anymore. Straight line winds, courtesy of the derecho. But there's also other fears, man-made fears. Some of you might be old enough to remember doing the nuclear dust or, or drills where you got underneath your desks at school, or even the, you know, the book over your head for the tornado drills. And neither one of those. They made us feel good. But do you honestly think they were going to help? <laughs> what the psalmist is trying to tell us that even when there's no real earthly help, that even in things like what we just talked about and many other things, we have no need to fear. The psalmist is telling us that even in the worst, God, That means total destruction. We could experience absolute, total, absolute destruction, but we can find our refuge in God. God is a permanent and eternal refuge for us, not just some temporary shelter from a storm. But as we go through life, there's often that question that says, when will this terrible feeling end? When will it end? When a loved one passes away, the feelings that we have vary tremendously. For some, they may have already gone through a grieving time because of a long and drawn out illness. For others, like my, when my mom passed, it's sudden. And that grieving process is difficult because it then becomes long and drawn out. It lingers because you weren't expecting it. You weren't ready for it. Now, there's other situations where we cannot seem to get rid of that terrible feeling because that situation is ongoing. That is the case when it came to my bullying. It was ongoing 
year after year after year. And I thought, what can I do? At this point, I didn't have a, a real strong relationship with the Lord. I knew he existed. I knew who he was, but I didn't have a strong relationship. And so I thought, what can I do? So I went out for track because I could run. And I got really good at it. And I set records in the 400 meter hurdles for my school. I thought, I've done something. I've made an achievement. And you know what? Nothing stopped. It just continued on and on. The other day I was talking to someone who's being blackmailed for something that they told me they had not done. Constantly getting calls and text messages trying to blackmail them. They'd block the number and what would happen? They'd just change the number where it came, where it came from. They'd just create a new Google number because, you know, those are free. You can just keep doing it over and over again. It just wouldn't stop. Now, as some of you know, I work for one of the phone companies, so we just changed this number. And hopefully that will be the end of it. But just like him or any of us, at one time or another, we have all been accused of something, whether it was true or not. And I think you can all agree that it's a very horrible feeling. But that's part of living in a fallen world. It's not really too hard for us to see that Satan is behind it. Listen to this quote from John Eldridge in Walking the Dead. He said, the story of your life is the story of the long and brutal assault on your heart by the one who knows what you can be and fears it. In other words, Satan knows who you can be in Christ and he fears that so he is going to come after you and attack you. When we planted this church, I kid you not, Mark and I and our families were under attack. And we still experience that. That just tells us we're doing something right. But we have a refuge in our eternal Savior. This quote is saying the enemy will always be assaulting you and accusing you in this life. This life. He is going to destroy your heart and steal your life. That's his goal. Why? Because one, well, for non-believers, he doesn't want them to have a relationship with Jesus. So he's going to do whatever he can to destroy their lives and make them mad and not want anything to do with God. And for those of us who are, he is going to try to tear down our lives and our relationship with Jesus. He's going to try. I've been reading through the book of Job. I just cleared chapter 37 today. We're almost to the end where Job gets his, <laughs> gets his uh, what he has coming to him, which is he's held on to God as his refuge. God is going to bless him. And Job and us, we need to know that the battle is already won. If you've read the Bible from cover to cover, you know that we win. No fear here. Psalm 56, 1 and 4 says this, O oh God, have mercy on me, for people are hounding me. My foes attack me all day long. I am constantly hounded by those who slander me, and many are boldly attacking me. But when I'm afraid, I will put my trust in you. I will praise God for what he has promised. I trust in God. So why should I be afraid? What can mere mortals do? Earthly, they can do a lot. Eternally, they can't touch us. Psalm 118.6 uh, from the New International Version says that this way, the Lord is with me, I'm not, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The psalmist found this extremely important for us to hear. So they wrote it in there these two times. They're telling us that even though we have an accuser who wants to shame us, condemn us and tear us down we have someone even greater on our side we have a savior who died on the cross to not only make us right with god but he made us victorious we have a wonderful example of that in john chapter 8 
Listen to what John writes in verses 1 and 11. He says, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives. But early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery, and they put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and rubbed the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and he said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. And he stooped down again and rubbed the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I go and sin no more. Now, interesting side note to this, the the religious leaders here, they totally disregarded the law. They should have brought the man along as well. It tells us in Deuteronomy that if a man is discovered committing adultery, both he and the woman must die. And that's how evil is purged from Israel. It was a trap. And in true form, Jesus was able to turn it around. Can you imagine the shame that that woman felt being drugged by these religious leaders, not just to Jesus, but into a crowd of people and being accused? Now, she was caught in the act, so we know that she is guilty. But Jesus said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone and they they didn't know what to do they just <laughs> they knew they were sinners so they just left <clears throat> maybe you keep finding yourself in sin maybe you keep going back to it over and over again even though you said you never would well here's the thing even when this happens Jesus is there saying to your accusers let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. And since we live in a fallen world where everyone has sinned, he says to us, go and sin no more. He is the only one who stands between you and the enemy of your heart. First John 2 and 1 says, My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, you have, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. So when you ask, is there a way out? The answer is yes. Jesus is always there, and he will always have a way. No matter what your situation, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're dealing with, Jesus promises to deliver us. Now, does that mean it's going to be smooth sailing? No. It's going to be like the streets in Cedar Rapids. It's going to be full of potholes. <coughs> but that, that's okay. Because we're not going to be going through it on our own. And you may feel like you're doing it on your own. But trust me, you most certainly are not alone. When you are going through difficulty and wonder where God is, remember that the teacher, is always quiet during the test. The teacher is always quiet during the test, so you are not alone. In fact, let's look at Luke 23, 39 to 43. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffs, so you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself, and us too, while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God even when you 
have been sentenced to die. We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Here's the important part of this passage. Jesus replied, I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. I can't imagine what this criminal had gone through in his life, what turned him to a life of crime, what led him to being crucified on a cross next to Jesus. But in all of his humanity, there was nothing he could do to get out of it. There was absolutely no escape from his circumstances. Not his earthly circumstances. By calling on Jesus, he escaped a much worse consequence. Eternal separation from God. Jesus was his only hope, and Jesus is our only hope. Our escape is only through Jesus who, res who will rescue us. Psalm 91, 14 and 16 says this, The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. He is our escape. But then I hear, oh, pastor, will I be able to rebuild my life after this? Absolutely. With Jesus, your life can not only be rebuilt, but totally restored. Several times throughout scripture, Jesus is referred to as our rock. Psalm 18, 2 says, the Lord is my rock, my fortress and my savior. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield the power that saves me and my place of safety. This psalm gives us a picture of God being our firm foundation. How does that help us? Well, Matthew 16, Jesus replies to Simon, who has just answered him. He says, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you, you did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. And all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Through scripture we have established Jesus is the rock of our salvation through his death on the cross. Peter is identified by Jesus as the rock on which his church, Jesus' church, would be built. But Peter, like believers since, declared that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And because of that, Peter reminds us in 1 Peter 2 that Christians are the church built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Jesus as the cornerstone. If we are built on that foundation, we are also the rock. So you can see that Psalm shows God is our firm foundation and together we are the church. Do you see how that comes together? This makes us strong enough to withstand anything the world throws at us. It's time to stop dwelling on our personal failures, our personal shortcomings, and all the other things that the accuser wants us to dwell on and put Jesus where he belongs in our lives. We must acknowledge his power and authority. And today is riddled with these truths that come from the psalm, including this one from 40 verse 2, where the psalmist writes, He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. If you've not come to the realization yet this morning, I want you to know that you are redeemed. Your past, your present, your future have been redeemed. That means in Jesus, whatever you have done in the past, whatever harm you have experienced, has been redeemed. Nothing, and I mean nothing, is too big or out of reach for our Redeemer. If you've not read the book of Ruth, this is a story of redemption. If you haven't read it, you need to. Because according to the various laws of the Pentateuch, a male relative had the privilege or responsibility to act on behalf of a relative who was in trouble, danger, or need as their kinsman redeemer. Ruth didn't do anything to earn Boaz, who became her husband. 
but by blood, he was her kinsman redeemer. A kinsman redeemer then is a relative who is rich and is in the position to redeem you out of your debt or your widowhood or to avenge your debt. That is what Boaz was to Ruth. Boaz was related to Ruth's deceased husband, so they were related by blood. This is why Jesus became a man. In doing so, he became connected to us by blood. God wants to redeem each of us, removing the debt of our sin. Ephesians 1, 7 says this, He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. The ransom's paid. Receive God's redemption through Jesus' blood and take rest in your kinsman redeemer. We are redeemed. It's an amazing feeling to know that. And yeah, you're probably going to end up still feeling lost and alone sometimes, but you're not. Not only do you have God, you have your church family. We are here for you to help you walk through whatever you're going through. Father God, as we close our message today, I pray that we never have to ask where you are again, because we will know that you are right there beside us. And sometimes, as the poem says, when there's only one set of footprints, you're carrying us through it. And though our, the things we go through here on earth, Father, may be difficult, we know that you love us and that we know that when we call on the name of your Son, that when we truly believe, not just words of, of a prayer to say, hey, Father, I've sinned and I accept Jesus, let it be something that we feel with our heart. Let us spend time with you each and every day, both in prayer and in the scriptures, so that we can get to know you better, Father. Help us to find that time to carve out, to make time for you, because you make time for us 24-7, 365 days a year, all of our lives. We need business of life, Father. Maybe that, Father, you remind us to set the alarm for a half hour or an hour earlier each day just so that we can get up and spend time with you and truly understand that you are a redeemer and that you are with us in each and everything that we go through. In Jesus' name. Pastor Terry. As we come into this time of communion this morning, it is a time for us to both join together with Christ, with God, and to reflect on and remember the sacrifice that was made. See, what we need to understand as we go through lives and as, as the scriptures told us this morning, we're hanging on that cross next to Jesus. We are that other sinner. We are condemned to die. But through his grace, through God's redeeming grace, he sent Jesus to take our place. And he actually let us down from our cross. Gave us eternal salvation, eternal love that will never die. We are called to remember his sacrifice. And as a lot of us do, we wear crosses. I have one underneath here that I never take off. And it's an outward symbol for other people to know my inward commitment to Christ, knowing that he brought me down from that cross. I am saved by his grace. I'm saved by his mercy. So even though I'm that person who's standing up and I'm a sinner in front of everyone else, he says, you're saved by grace. The paid price has been paid. 
So as we come into this time of, of communion today, remember that as a communion, we are called as gathers of believers. We are joined together. We are communed together as one in Christ. On the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke the bread and he said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Likewise, later in the meal, he took the cup. And after he had blessed the cup, he said, This cup is my blood shed for you. It is a new covenant, meaning it is a new and renewed vow and promise from God. That in and through this, you are redeemed by my body and my blood body and blood of Christ. And he said, each time that you are gathered together, take of this bread and drink of this cup and do it in remembrance of me. And that's what we are doing today. We are joining together to remember that sacrifice, the redemption, the price that had been paid for us by Christ on the cross. body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Peace of God be with us. Amen. Come into this time today for prayers of the people and and uh, we have a prayer sheet that is back on the back table back in here that we go through each and every Wednesday and it's four pages long on both sides of people that we pray for and so as we come forth today we we want to lift those people up in prayer and uh, we pray both for an awakening to come into people's hearts so that they will come into a relationship with Christ and come into a church family to be a member of a body of Christ together as well. Uh, are there other people we need to pray for today? Yes. Continue prayers for Jenna and her travels. Jenna and her travels. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to pray for my son Demetrius. I hope that he finds the path that God wants him on. And I want to pray for John Anthony. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we we hear your calls of your people. Lord, we lift them up to you today. We we lift these prayers up to you for awakenings of faith, for faith families to be joined in communion with each other in and through you. Lord, we lift up these people who have illnesses and struggles in their lives, and we we ask, Lord, that you would intervene, that you would stand in front of those things that are blocking them from you, blocking your healing. We ask for a mighty healing in your name. And Lord, as your word tells us today, as we heard over and over again in the scriptures that were written, that you are victorious over all these things, that you are bigger than any problem that we shall face, and that we should find refuge, we should find solace. We should find healing in you. Lord, we lift all these things up and we claim them today as victories in your name. Through your son, Jesus. We claim a victory over sickness and illness. We claim it above the demons that are attacking us in our lives. We claim it above tumors. We claim it above all of these things that would keep people separated from you the attacks of the enemy, whether they be mental or physical or spiritual. Lord, we lift them up to you and we claim victory over those things in your name. 
Father God, we praise you and thank you that you allow us to be here today and that you are in this room with us today in your spirit. And we ask for your Holy Spirit to dwell within us each and every day. For those who are online, for those who are here in person, Lord, we ask your blessing upon them today that your word would live, that your word would grow within them and your word would reveal your truths to their hearts. Father God, we praise you and thank you in all of these things and pray your victory over them all in Jesus' name. This brings us to the close of our online portion of our service. I had a scripture picked out for our benediction, and God, <laughs> God said, "No, you picked it out. I picked this one out." <laughs> so this this comes from Ephesians chapter six. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. This is what we are talking. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our tr struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Put on the full armor of God. We are taking God. We're taking this book, which people say, oh, it's just paper, it's just paper and bound together. There's so much more to this. Putting on the full armor of God. Go and read Ephesians 6 when you get home. See what it means about that full armor of God and the pieces to it. But God is our refuge, as our call to worship said this morning. Go to him with each and everything that you have. And also go to your church family. Reach out to them because they're there for you as well. Father, thank you that you're there for us. Thank you that we can come to you in the worst moments and in the best moments of our life. You are always there. Let us be continually reminded of that. Let our faith grow daily. May our relationship with you grow daily. Father, when it is our time to leave this earthly place, 